Welcome to A Chat With Heart Podcast. I'm your host, Christina Martin. I'm here to guide us on this journey of heartfelt and uncensored conversations with friends I've met while touring my music in Europe and across North America, and people who have life experience that I genuinely believe we can all learn from. Our personal stories have great power to heal, influence, and inspire. All we have to do is show up for the conversation. If we just talk about it, we could shut a light, we could break a dark day. If we just talk about it, we can cut away, we can make a better day. Hello, my little heartbeats. This is episode one. The perfect first guest. I believe, is my best friend and the co-producer and engineer of this podcast, Dale Murray. Just to clarify, he's not going to be my co-host. That is not something he is interested in. And to be honest, I am way more comfortable with and interested in one-on-one conversations with my guests. He is going to be working with me to make every episode the best it can be. Dale has been a musician since the late 80s. He's been running a studio for the last decade, where he produces, engineers, mixes albums, and plays guitar and other sonic delights that make the songs shine. He's toured with some of Canada's most loved artists, like Cuff the Duke, Hayden, Matt Mays, Buck 65, Serena Ryder, that's just to name a few. He's more than just a musician, folks. He just won an award for the best husband during the pandemic. That's right, we've been married since 2011, and we'll tell you more about that eventful day during this chat. That was a made-up award, but he has won actual awards for Audio Professional of the Year, Musician of the Year, and Producer of the Year. I'm kicking off Season 1 of A Chat with Heart with my best friend, my soulmate, my favorite person, Dale Murray. You got your wine? I do. I've got my water. This is wild. I just want to say, it's been years. I don't know how many years, definitely years before the pandemic started that you have been encouraging me to host a podcast. Mm -hmm. And this year I had a consultant work with me on my podcast plans and, and I was really adamant about, you know, I can do this all by myself, engineering, recording, editing, you know, and, but I got, I got to say, I hit it. I hit a snag. I I just kept procrastinating and something terrified me about it. And you, like you've done many other times in my life, have jumped in and said, how can I help? I want to help. I want to, you basically offered to engineer this and you've been listening to every idea shaping the ideas completely I came up with the with the with the uh, name you came up with the name (laughs) we were listening to a path with heart oh right I so I keep referring to uh, a path with heart from uh, Carlos Castaneda yeah we were listening to that Don Juan we were listening to it in the car right on tour it was an audio book and we were also talking about doing a podcast and and it's and a path with heart has just come up so many times over the years that we're on it. We're on a path with, with yeah, heart. Yeah, and so I thought, well, what what do you do in a podcast? You chat, you, a chat with heart. It just made sense to me. We talk about so much in the car when we're on tour, like. A lot of it is when we talk. We talk about a lot of stuff. Right. We actually go through hours and hours of not talking at all which I found a little unnerving initially when we first started seeing each other and we're doing tours like I thought does this person not like me is he completely bored with me it's my it's my meditation time driving it's always been like that you know what it it works you come up with great ideas. Mm-hmm. I benefit from those ideas. And a chat with heart was one of those ideas that just stuck. Ever ever since you, you suggested that title for this podcast, never have I 
strayed or thought of other ideas or wanted to like that was that was just it like Mm -hmm. it just felt right and um so thank you you're welcome let's begin with where you're from where you grew up yeah i grew up in dartmouth nova scotia you know i went went to school all through school there um but spent a lot of the like you know, summers and, and any holidays and stuff up in the area that we live in now, which is the North Shore of Nova Scotia. So I, I sort of, I guess when I was, you know, growing up, I always said I was from Dartmouth, but this place always felt more like home than home did. Um, so I feel at home now. I love it. Yeah. Tell us about the role that music played in your life growing up and how you got your hands on your first instrument. Mm -hmm. Well, music was always a music fan, but then when I hit 11 or 12, I got obsessed with it. Like I could, that the only thing I could think of was, was guitar. That was it for me. Were you envisioning yourself as a front man or in a band or what did that do you remember what that maybe looked like or felt or did you when just I was, when I first got the bug you mean yeah when you got the bug and you you <clears throat> wanted a guitar yeah it was all about the sounds it was it was there was nothing like I didn't think about playing in a band I, I just was listening and especially guitar when there was a, an especially good guitar sound or or the guitar was prominent in a song that's what I zoned in on and I was like how how do you make that sound I know it's a guitar because I can see on the in the in the music video that somebody's holding one and they're playing it and it's I think it's an electric guitar uh it looks different than an acoustic guitar and I knew what an acoustic guitar was because my dad always had one so there were always acoustic guitars around and I and actually one of my uncles played electric guitar as well so I think I, I, I sort of knew the difference, and I certainly knew the difference by the sound of of the electric guitar. So I zoned in on that. I was like, I like acoustic guitar, but I really like this sound, and I'm so interested on at how do you create that, and yeah. I wanted to do that. So I knew I needed an electric guitar. So tell us about your first electric guitar. I was 12 years old, and so I asked for a, a guitar for Christmas. But I guess I asked about it enough that they thought seriously about about it. And I, I think there were enough musicians in my family that they were like, well, it's maybe he has the the music gene as well, you know. The, my point is they were on the fence about it. They were like, oh, we, should we buy it? But they did. <laughs> and it was super exciting. <laughs> Christmas morning. like. But then that was the beginning. That was like, okay, now I have it. Now what the hell do I do? How, like, because I still didn't know how to make the sound that I wanted to do. I didn't know how to tune the guitar. My hands were tiny. I was 12 years old and I was small for my age. So for the first, I don't know, like half a year, I just like dragged it around and and that was it. Because I, because, you know, I knew a few chords. My dad had, had taught me, you know, like, you know, G, D, C. You know, so much of it is making sure you look good with it. And I think you, yeah. that was important time for you to spend just you and your guitar in the mirror. Mm-hmm. Um, you've definitely... I'm sure a lot of guitar players have done that. Yeah. Before, you know, before they even learn it. It's like, do I look cool with this? Yeah, you've got that mm, down. Sort of. yeah. But you also, I mean, um, comments that I hear regularly uh, after your performances, people will come up and, uh, and ask you about your tone. And mm-hmm. from back... To what, back when you were 12 years old up until, you know, now, um, if somebody listening who was just picking up the guitar and kind of wanted to have that sound that you have, um, what would you say to them? What would you suggest? You know? Well, I would always suggest that they they come up with it themselves. I mean, that's that's partly like, you know, with a singer, you're you're born, born with it with a voice that's the tone and you can practice and you can get better at it and stuff but but with a guitar there's you can go any 
any which way and it's just about what you want to to come across and um what's and, like what sounds good to you what versus sounds, what other people what you're hearing on the radio or like your the people that you look up to it's what what feels what resonates with you i don't know i mean i would just say trial and error and you know like i mean my tone when i first started was probably horrendous like i remember putting a fuzz pedal and then a distortion pedal and another distortion pedal all in a row when i first when i first started playing because i i just wanted as much fuzz as i possibly could and it was mm-hmm. fun but it was very wasn't very useful did you know back then that the chain of the order of the chain of pedals no, affects no, it was like, your sound? No, absolutely not. Like I, I, I don't think that I came to anything close to what my sound is now, or the you know the the essence of what it is, until I bought a really nice amp, which is a super a Fender Super Reverb. Picked that up, and then I picked up my old SG uh, Chesco guitar, which was a a pretty cheap guitar but because of that combo then I was like okay I I can see where I can go with this and then it it progressed from there but probably for any guitar player there's that moment of of like something clicks and and then you build on top of that of course tell us about the amps that you use in your studio and on the road well my my go-to amp and the amp that I would take anywhere if I could uh, is um, a 1970s deluxe Fender Deluxe Reverb. Honestly most of my tone comes from the guitar, the pedals and I've had other people say that over the years it's like I can plug I can plug into whatever and it still sounds like me. So there's very I mean I can tell the difference I don't know if anyone else can depending on what what amp I'm I'm in. I think it's more of a feel thing than than sound. So, tell us about your the pedals that you're using then today. Well, I use a volume pedal a lot, and I got into the habit of using that. Um, you kind of have a technique with that, I think. Yeah, and it comes from the pedal steel. This is from playing pedal steel. Like it's it's I don't know. Like with a duo, I find that if you know if if I were just strumming along. It would get boring. Uh, That's my job. To you strum. do. You, you're the rhythm. You're the drums. You're the bass. Like you're, you're the rhythm section. Stop it. But, but Thanks, with, babe. but as a lead guitar or even second rhythm or whatever, I find volume pedal really adds. It really adds a lot. Like you can, you can do the swells. You can take the attack of the guitar out, and so it doesn't even sound like a guitar. I also play. All, like exclusively with a with a compressor pedal, and without getting too much into it, uh, compressors sort of squash the sound into a its own little area. But you sort of some sometimes can lose the dynamics of of it if you're using a, a compressor. So a volume pedal sort of compensates for that. There's an overdrive pedal, a Boss overdrive pedal that I've had for years, and that's just a nice warm overdrive. Um, There's a pedal that sounds um, like a, a symphony is playing. Yeah, it's a Mel Nine pedal. I I, I bought uh, it's 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 supposed to mimic a a Mellotron, which is you know made famous by the Beatles, that flute sound that you hear in Strawberry Fields. Um, <clears throat> That's add a, a lot, I think, to our uh, duo performance. Yeah, uh, and I didn't. Songs. I didn't even buy it for uh, knowing that it would that it would be used in the live setting. I just I bought it because I was doing a record and we needed a Mellotron sound, and but it adds a lot live. And then I just use some reverb and delay. Yeah, um, really, that's not uh, not too complicated a setup. Well, this leads me to talk about the guitars. Since I met you and we started playing together, you were playing. Now um, uh, you were playing the Tesco actually when I first met you, I think. And then you bought a Gretsch, a yeah. second hand. It was shortly after I met you. Fourth, fifth hand. Who knows? It's from the seventies, isn't it? Or sixties? Sixties, yeah. Uh, 
so that was kind of that was the main guitar that you were bringing on tour for our shows Mm -hmm. and why don't you tell the story about how we got so lucky to uh find the Dusenbergs. uh yeah well we we started touring in in europe 2011 and yeah my, my main guitar at that point was the gretsch it was it's a gretsch a gretsch nashville 1963 i think a big orange guitar and uh we um we we're playing i guess it was the second time we had gone over because the first time we just brought acoustic guitars i brought a 12 string acoustic but uh the second time I had brought the Gretsch over, and at some point during the show, somebody asked, you know, how, what, what is, what is this guitar you're playing? How old is it? Because it does look vintage. And, uh, and I said, I told everyone exactly what it was and exactly the year, and that was fine. But after the show, somebody came up to me and they said, well, I'm a, a um, customs agent. And just so you know that you shouldn't tell anybody the age of your guitar because the right person hears it like like he was like he knew that those guitars are made out of um brazilian rosewood and it's so, restricted wood it's restricted wood and and apparently you can have your your instrument confiscated if they find out mm-hmm. about it so that made me nervous. <laughs> and I think somebody else on that tour as well said the same thing. I, it was twice that it happened. So we played Osnabrück, Germany, on that tour. And uh, we met what turned out to be a really good friend of ours now, uh, Heinz Rebellius. Best name ever. And Heinz had a connection Yeah, he had a, with he had, the he had, Duesenberg company. Yeah, that's right. He said, we didn't even ask about Duesenberg. He just said, oh, well, you can't, if you can't bring your Gretsch over, you really should check out this company. Because somebody who plays a Gretsch can really take to these guitars, you know, more so than somebody who plays a Telecaster or a Stratocaster or whatever else. Uh, I think Gretsches are the closest thing um, to the Duesenbergs that... I've seen. They sound fantastic with the Fender amps. Um, I play my Duesenbergs through uh, a Princeton Fender tube amp. Um, One's vintage from the 60s, and one is from the last five years. I bought it five years ago, I think. Yeah, Um, they just sound good through whatever. You were signed to a record deal with... EMI in high school, were you not? Just out of high school. That's incredible. Yeah, but you don't really know how incredible it is when it when you when you know when you're in it. I mean, we're all excited about it, but when you're young, you don't know. You just think, "Oh, this is the way it's supposed to go." You, Did, form, you really? form a band, you write some songs, you play a bunch of shows, then you get signed. You know. Tell me about those early bands that you were in and and your experiences with the record industry. Well, I was in bands all through high school. and uh, Were you writing songs? Or were I you... was co-writing songs. Yeah. I wasn't writing... Like, we were writing as, as a band. You Lyrics know? and melodies or just melodies? You... Mostly music and melodies. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I guess, I, I, you know, the band that you were talking about that, that was signed, that was formed in, in high school um, because everybody knew each other and 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 people were dropping out of one band and joining other bands. So I, I joined this band called Booming Airplanes um, and that was the band that sort of broke out a bit more than any other and I, I, I don't know why. Was it from a gig? Like where, how did this signing, how did this discovery of... It was... It was during this time when bands were getting signed up and to to record labels all over the place and you know in the states. Uh, so A and R people were sniffing around. A and R people were around and and so we were watching all these bands get snatched up and we got signed not uh, not to a major label at first. It was a subsidiary of uh, EMI called Latitude Records and. The label went under shortly after we signed. Uh, almost, <laughs> Not your fault. 
Well, maybe. I don't know. But um, we had made the record, and then shortly after, the label folded. And so EMI, who was the, you know, that, that was the umbrella that every, that Latitude was under, they had the option to pick up whoever they wanted, really. But but because we were already sort of part of, of it, that was fine. But it was, we got pushed straight to the back burner because we hadn't established anything. We didn't have time to establish anything because the labels was falling apart as we were putting our record out. And then, and we had nothing to build on. So that, that, that deal basically just fell apart. And then the band fell apart after, um, the, the remnants of that band, which was Serge Sampson, Ruth Minikin and myself, we sort of just moved over and added a bunch of other people. And that morphed into a band called the Guthrie's, which was a, a little bit different. It was sort of Laurel Canyon, country rock that's what we were going for we really started touring and we were independent completely independent and we did tours in canada and in in the uk and had a bit of a following and i guess the decade after the guthrie's happened was like a pretty all over the place type of decade the whole catalyst of the whole thing was that i started playing pedal steel and that just opened up all the doors for me. Dale? Yes? You know I love conversation games, right? Yes. When the pandemic started and all of our tour dates were canceled, we did what so many other musicians did. We started gigging online. And it was weird at first, wasn't it? It was weird. I mean, it was fun, but it, it was, was different. it was different. It was awkward. It was, it was just, I didn't know how to connect with people the same way that we knew how to connect with people and had been for so many years in face to face in a room. So conversation games helped me connect and engage with an online audience. Right now, we're going to take turns reading a card from one of my favorite conversation games. So these questions are from the game Fluster, which our little heartbeat listeners can buy at www.flustergame.com and save 15% by using my promo code Christina15. Cool. I'm going to ask the first one. All right. I'm ready. What's something that you've learned to love? I have learned to love watching shows, even binge watching shows. Um you know, like Gilmore Girls. It was a conscious decision for me not to watch television shows. I would I would make time for movies. I love watching movies. But I just didn't want to spend my time watching shows. But I've learned to love it because I think it's quality time with you and it's good for me to relax. And even if it's mind-numbing at times, um, I just love my time with you. So, yeah, I've learned to love watching shows. Nice. What do you think is your worst quality? Uh, my worst quality probably is my indecisiveness. I have a hard time making decisions over anything, really. Well, every morning you have a smoothie. That's a. That's so I don't have to make the decision. I know. I just know what I'm going to have. I do like to remember how we met. This is when I was going to quit music and become a cruise sales specialist. And I was playing like one of my last shows and Matt Mays, who had been in the Guthrie's with you, Mm -hmm. um, came to that show and we were chatting and I was just kind of like, I don't know how you do music for a living. I don't know how you do it. And I don't know, he kind of gave me a pep talk and he invited me to the studio, uh, the echo chamber with the he was doing some demos with Charles Austin. So I went in the next day and that's where I met you. I had heard about you. My ex-husband, Evan Colvord, had uh, mentioned you, brought your music into our life. At that time, I was um, finishing my degree at St. Mary's University and I had very little time to socialize or go out. I was I stayed home, studied, and Evan was 
the one that was out playing music all the time and he spoke very highly about you and so I had I knew of you and I really assumed that your first album solo album Brighter Lives Darker Side um that you produced that I did okay good (laughs) okay well that was a good calling card because um you know, I produced I, it, but I didn't engineer it. You didn't really have your own studio set up. I didn't have any gear. Time. I you didn't have nothing. a computer. I didn't have a phone. Yeah, I, I thought you nothing. had that all figured out. And and we we hung out that night in, when we met in the studio. And at some point, I asked you if you wanted to work on some demos. I don't remember this, to be honest, because it was a very intoxicated night. Well, in, in any case, it was surprising to me. But I was open to it because I had just bought I had bought some gear. I was doing demos for myself, and that summer I had just done a record, and it turned out well. So had I not had it not like just two months earlier done that, I may have been like, oh God, I'm not I'm not ready. But f- f- you just asked at the right time, and I was like, I think I can do this. And and I heard some of your songs that night, the night that we were hanging out. And I knew I knew where you were coming from stylistically. It was something that I was comfortable with. Yeah, so there were a lot of the same influences, and I could tell even just from that first night that it was something that I could. I thought I I, I really thought I could do. You put out two solo records of your own. You're a really talented songwriter, singer, frontman. I've been in your band. I love it because I don't have to talk. Uh, and you are great. You're a great frontman. Frontman. You're a great frontman. Frontman. You're frontman. No, it's great to see you um, front in the band, like taking charge. Is that something that you want to do more of, or do you want to leave it open? I didn't know at the time when I was making those rec- like my first record and the second record, that I was doing those records because I wanted to produce. Them. I loved coming up with parts and I loved being part of the mixing and, and recording and I, I loved all that side of it but I didn't really like the writing of the songs so, mm-hmm. so much uh, sort of like a, I mean I learned how to play guitar and because I, I love the guitar I, I wanted to sing and perform yeah, and entertain it, it was a means to an end a means to an end and my end was production mixing and engineering i didn't know at the time but that's what it was like that's what i loved most about it so when somebody comes in with you know on an acoustic guitar and plays me a song and says what can we do with it my whole brain lights up and i'm Mm -hmm. like this is what we can do with it and this is how we can get it done it's just what happens that's why i was writing the song so that i could get to that point totally get it i mean it studio time for me can be quite painful i love writing alone you know and and finishing a song is something it's so satisfying and um, being in the middle of it even yeah and you're uh, because you love the process of writing a song and and yeah i love i read about writers and the process and i journal i write i you don't do any of that but what you i do see you spending a lot of time is is watching engineering videos so you're studying all the people that do the things you love to do producing engineering mixing um but i think always like that you really do prefer like if we are working on a song together it's the music it's the it all goes back to that very like when i was listening to songs on the radio and the sound like i love sounds i Mm -hmm. love the sounds of the guitar mostly but but that wasn't just it it was it was like wow that that echo on that person's voice or 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 whatever and 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 i i just remembered this the other day like i used to in my bedroom i had two cassette players and i would record something on one cassette player yeah play it back play along with that record it on the other one and keep bouncing back and forth it's i mean I didn't know anything about multi-track recording or anything. It just, in my mind, that's how I thought, oh, how can I build something with me playing a bunch of different stuff? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, if I do that, and then I play along with it and then record it on this. I mean, the the quality degraded every time, but I was like, (laughs) oh, cool. And then that was when I was fairly young, like probably 
13 or 14 doing that. Yeah. And but that was that's what I realized that's what I was going for from right at the beginning was trying to create sounds in the studio yeah. and make something cool that I could listen back to and and yeah, that's what I was that's always cool. going for. So you've got this studio it's in our house. Artists mm-hmm. come here and work with you on albums, on singles. Sometimes they don't even come here at all. They literally send you tracks or, you know, you record the tracks and then have them send the vocal track and mix it in. And sometimes you just mix albums. What If you had to pick, like, one of the things that you do as a producer, engineer, mixer, uh, yeah, what would that thing be that you'd like to do more of? I think um mixing would be would be the thing yeah. but but creatively the production side is like I I would definitely miss that Yeah, well you'd miss it. a lot of things. I mean, I know you love playing live. I do. We, we yeah. talked about we've complained about being on tour and wish that we were home. Well, everybody and, has. Because <laughs> it is exhausting, but yeah. but I mean, there were times where things were running so smoothly and we just were, we've loved being on tour. I've loved it and I know you have too. And, and the shows are great. You just yeah. feel so good at the end of the night. I mean, we always we're always like beeline back to the hotel and in our pajamas within two seconds after. But you work. know why? Cuz we like each we like each other and I one of my favorite things to do is like cozy up with you in our PJs at the end of a, any day and but after a good show it really feels good that's to, true to, to like go we did a good <laughs> job tonight people really enjoy yeah. it and we it does feel good yeah yeah I really miss it we we are hoping to be able to get back to Europe we have a tour planned a beautiful tour planned starting in February of 2022 everybody cross your fingers the pandemic will um improve and that we can go on this tour that everyone can go on tour and do Mm -hmm. what they need to do um because i think more than ever now we both are like okay uh this would be we really want we really need this (laughs) i miss the uh energy from the audience i miss seeing people i know it'll still be like a little different i'll still be even more terrified to get sick on tour but i do miss the i miss the routine i miss doing what we love and what we're good at and mm-hmm. I miss getting ready for it with yeah. you. We had tastes of it this summer playing a few shows and you know here and there but it, you don't it's not the same as as being on the road and playing oh like night over after and night over and get really like it becomes like second nature. It becomes second nature but it also new things happen because you're so you don't have to think about how to play the song or how the show should go. The yeah. show's just because you've done them so many times and then new things can happen and and when the audiences are good and yeah, Spont- it's, spontaneity yeah. starts to happen. Yeah, more. exactly. And nerves go away so that it's yeah. much more free flowing. Yeah, it's it's definitely something to look forward to. Um when we started talking about the idea of me hosting a podcast, I was really hooked on the idea of um you know, t- talking to people about their stories and where they come from, but also um, breaking negative cycles in our mm-hmm. lives. Yeah. And so I want to ask you about the challenges that you've faced in your life. They could be from the past or recently. Um, and, you know, how you've kind of worked to overcome them during the pandemic. You, you know, work with a naturopath to get down to the heart of the matter or get into your guts yeah, <laughs> get yeah. to the guts of the matter and yeah. and you did this treatment for like four or five six months you discovered that you had something called SIBO mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to small intestinal bacteria small intestine small intestinal bacterial <laughs> gro- overgrowth. overgrowth and that <sighs> this thing could have been the thing that was plaguing you since it could have been 20 years well I, yeah yeah I mean I was on, I was a sort of a sickly child and uh, I was sick a lot and I was on antibiotics a lot and um, definitely could have been, nobody knows and, and, and there's no way of finding out, but, but uh, you know, when you're on a lot of antibiotics, that's, that's going to play havoc on your digestive system. Your, yeah. Your digestive system. It, it's 
microbiome in your stomach. It, it's so important. And, and, uh, it affects your mental health, your physical yeah, health, absolutely. the whole thing, how you feel, your energy level, all that stuff. You were like, essentially ever since I knew you up until recent years, you were, it seemed like you were malnourished. Cause looking at you now, I mean, you look younger than when I first met you, you look healthier. Mm. I know that there's still days where things aren't perfect. Yeah. Um, but t- talk about the difference between, you know, post uh, versus pre SIBO treatment. Well, uh, I'm going to start here. Uh, being a touring musician has never, uh, even at least at the time when I started doing it, was never the most healthy uh, occupation. And not that it can't be. And Now and, I and, find it is. And yeah, and, we, and like for- we found our way with it. But when you're a young a young guy and you're out there with your friends, you know, you're in bars every night, you're drinking uh, booze, you're drinking lots of it. And everyone wants to, everyone wants to buy you drinks too. Like and everyone that. wants to buy you drinks and, and you don't think anything's wrong because you're, this is the world that you've created and everyone in the, in the world that, you know, in your van and your band they're all doing the same things. It also is fun. Like it feels pretty good. When oh, you're, it's free. To, you it feel doesn't... free, and you feel like you can. But yeah. when you have, when you have a, a, a system, a bodily system like mine, I mean, some people have no problem with keeping up with that. But I, my, I just felt my body just deteriorating. I the... Yeah, I don't know how you did. I never would have been able to sustain. I, I mean, but even I, when we first started playing uh, shows, we were doing shots and yeah, we were, but we weren't on tour. I think no, I started the true. no drinking for myself rule, um, and I've quit drink. I don't drink at all now, um, but I kind of quit drinking many times over the years, and most of the time I had that rule of on tour, I wouldn't drink, and and there were times when. I feel like we did drink and, and we had fun and it was yeah. it seemed manageable and but we always had like days to recuperate and yeah. Um, yeah it's just when you can't remember the last time you went to bed sober that's, that's it's when troubling. things get yeah and and yeah. and and I've had the, I had the discussion I remember many times on tour it was like when was the last time you went to sleep not drunk or or like I remember one time playing a show in Ottawa and having to get on a flight to go to the East, East Coast Music Awards and PEI the next morning. So st- just staying at the club, drinking all night, going directly to the airport. And I remember having my pedal steel there and like throwing it, like, you know, going through through uh, security and cutting my hand open on the oh thing, and bleeding and stinking like booze and getting on the flight. And then the guys who sat next to me, I could hear them going... It smells like a brewery in here, <laughs> and like, and not yeah, yeah. caring at the time. But now I'm like, that's sort of embarrassing. And it's sort of gross, yeah. Yeah, but that's what ev- everybody I was playing with. The, I mean, there I, I thought I was actually sort of tame compared to some of the people that I was that I was traveling with. Uh, so, well, it's... it wasn't until really I met you, and then you were like going for runs in the morning and I was like oh yeah that and then at, at when I first met you I had started playing around with uh like the the sort of going gluten free because I thought that might be something that could help me which it ended up being a turning point with me yeah. not not even just because it did actually help but because it made me more conscious of my diet which then made me more conscious of my overall health, which made me conscious of I should be I should be exercising and and all this. I mean, it was a whole it was a whole thing that opened up to me. And then and then at, just at that time, you were there, and I was seeing you as a and you were a, a good role model for me. You Aww. Know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you still are. <laughs> Thanks, babe. I feel like. Uh... The tables have turned a bit, so okay, maybe I was a good role model for you in the beginning, and and then I think gradually, I I mean I really look to you, I mean, for so much um, 
I really, you know, admire your, your emotional maturity and your ability to just have this calm reason for things like some, I mean, I've broken down many, many times and you're, you've been there for me, uh, and you've always, um, not just listened, uh, you know, but really been the voice of reason and talked me through pretty much every break uh, down that I've had. My point is that I think, um, you know, you're more as much a positive role model to me now, um, as maybe I was in the beginning of our relationship. And I mean, I looked up to you then as well. Uh, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of yours <laughs> and, yeah, oh, but this is all because you were like an, uh, to hang out with someone like you was so different but I was at that time was that's what I was looking for I was like how do I it's it's exactly why we were why we started talking about this podcast like how do you break cycles yeah that was the cycle of like just doing whatever I felt like doing whenever I wanted I Uh, think I think that that (laughs) a little bit of that is fine. Yeah. But honestly, I have to schedule that for myself. Yeah. Because having too much time to do whatever you want mm-hmm. is it, it it's not good for me and it I spiral into I need routine. But letting yourself do whatever you want anytime you want is not a good thing ever. I don't I don't think so either. I think routine I I really thrive on routine. And, and that's what I was looking for at that p- point in my in my life. I think if I had met you a year or two before I had met you I I would have been like oh she's she's too uptight. I can't I yeah. can't, you know. But at that time I was like oh, I see what she's I see why she's doing this and I was at a point where my body was breaking down and I needed to make changes and I remember you saying how talking about how this it was like a cloud had lifted from your like yeah your I was vision. living it literally nothing just, was in focus like, nothing was in focus it, uh, like but but I didn't have a focus in my life either I, I just was doing anything that came up and that's fun for a while like you say yes to anything like but there was never any like okay once this is done then what do i do and like well that's the thing right like it's i've found that it's important to have routine but in that routine you do need to leave yourself open to things and how do you do that it's a balance it's like it's you are coming from one end of it and i was coming from the other end i was all spontaneity and and letting things come to me but it was like it was there were things that would come that would like, you know, not be a, a long lasting thing, uh, something that I could build on, you know what I mean? It was like, it was something that I just did and then it was done. Yeah. Where you want to have something that, that maybe you leave an, enough openness that things can come in, but you can build on it and keep going with it, you know? Like I, I never had that where it was like, yeah, when when that thing was done, it was done, and then we're like, okay, what's next? And mm-hmm. and and I think with you, you were like, you you had to learn to l- let more things come in that were spontaneous. And oh, I'm a big believer that I mean, I think everyone has to go through a period where you kind of say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. And part of that for me was finding out, like, say yes to everything, figure out who you are, who you want to be. But once you figure that out, then you start saying no to things. That's, yeah. And you you hone in and you really dedicate your time and make leave time aside for yourself. Mm-hmm. One last thing. Uh, we've been talking about routine. Then what's a routine day look, look like for you? Uh, you want to be specific? In, yeah, in I want the specifics. I've never been a morning person. I like to take the morning slow. Yes. And I like, and mornings are my learning time. Like, uh, so like between nine and 11, have a coffee, breakfast and coffee. And I'm. Smoothie. Smoothie, yeah, smoothie. And then a coffee. And, but that's when I'm like doing tutorials or reading or. Omega 3. 
Omega three, yeah. Or, vitamin D. Uh, vitamin D, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's my that's my like soaking in time and getting in, inspired. Like I'll even just watch like like people in the studio, be- the Beatles or 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 whoever in the studio, like watch videos of uh, or read something about it, uh, and then I'll get in, I'll get really j- like fired up about creating stuff and then I'll immediately move into this room here which is my my office my studio and start working on whatever needs to be worked on uh I'm working on a record right now but that but uh, like I like to fire myself up about it and then and get into it or like I'll I'll read something uh, a technique that somebody some other engineer or mixer has has done and I'll really want to come in here and try it out so yeah. yeah, so the mornings are pretty slow, but but not. I think there's a a, a purpose. Yeah, to it's your it. that's your learning time. That's yeah. that's kind of like essentially, even though we're very different, we do our own thing. Yeah, that's typically when I'm in the cycle. That's my time also to learn. Um, so then around noon, I'm annoying you to exercise. Is that accurate? Um. Yeah, most days. Yeah. So I'll. So yeah, I guess usually work like an hour. Uh, with with mixing and stuff, it's I've learned uh, from going to the the ear doctor that you know taking time off every hour is optimal. Like that's not going to happen all the time. Sometimes I'll work three hours and then and then take some time off. But it, just for ear health, that's the best thing to do. So in in any case, most days I'll work from eleven until twelve, twelve thirty one, whatever, and then we'll exercise, go for a hike, come back. Yeah, well, whatever it is, exercise, and then uh, then I'll work again on stuff until dinner. I'd love to be doing even more stuff. I'd like to be more busy than yeah. I am. I I could be more busy. I'd like to make more money. Yeah, but I don't know if I need to be busier because I'm pretty busy. But you're busy. I'd love to see both of us making lots of money. Let's be <laughs> let's be frank here. I think we're at that point in our lives where we like money. Uh, we see the benefits of it because we also like to put money back into our industry and hire other creators and um yeah that's the that's the thing like i i, I don't think we're just you know con- consumers we're not we're we're very conscious of where we're putting our money and what we're you know uh ethically where we're putting our money and I know it's like it's, it's great so but it's so annoying <laughs> <laughs> so boring tell us about some of the things like non-music related that you love to do you <laughs> even like just throw them out there like um I love uh, well I love to hike yeah I love to bike mm-hmm. I love to swim in the Northumberland Strait in the summer it's like that you know we have a living will and in it um are we're each going to be cremated and our ashes uh dispersed in the northumberland strait yeah because yeah. we're romantic uh fools that way that's my happy place that you're, you're we're gonna be so happy when we're cremated and wow. and just i'm terrified of uh like i don't i don't swim in the water uh, i don't swim where, where there else are more I sharks in and, this area now that global yeah. warming has happened but. but i love you so much i i'm gonna I'm going to do that. I'm going to allow my ashes to be out there with you because I just want to be with you. Really? So, That's the only... Oh, okay. Yeah, fuck. I wouldn't... I would not want to choose from Even my, if I die like 20 years before you, would you still do Yeah, it? if that's where your ashes are going to end up, I got to <laughs> follow through with that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like... Your wills can change. I don't... I mean, no. The shit thing would be if I died and you spread my ashes out there and then uh, you change your mind i'm gonna be fucking pissed oh i wouldn't change my mind well it's, what if you found another honey and then it's still my she was like are she gonna end up in there with us fuck a threesome. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great way to end the podcast thank you so much i love you you're my favorite person and uh, i'm really i'm really excited for the rest of our lives and i'm quite pleased with uh our lives uh, to date even more so in recent years yeah it's uh it's it was a, good... it was a rough start it sucked <laughs> well we broke up like four times not my fault 
What? <laughs> I'd say that it takes two to break up because of breakup. Let me see. Welcome to the Heartbeat Hotline, 1-902-669-4769. I'm the host of a Chat with Heart podcast, Christina Martin, and I'm so excited you called. Leave me your question, a suggestion for the podcast, or a comment about this episode. Please be aware your message may be used on the podcast and social media. Tell me your name, where you're calling from, and it's also fine if you want to remain anonymous. Thanks for listening. Have a great fucking day. I'm anxiously awaiting my voice messages from the Heartbeat Hotline. But you know what? I received a physical postcard from Black Cat with some questions. I'll put up a photo of the postcard on my Instagram and the message. But I'm going to read it to you now and try to answer the questions. Thank you so much, Black Cat, uh, for writing in to the podcast Dear A Chat With Heart, I'm wondering what you think are the most essential aspects of your routine that lend to your success. Do you have any advice on manifesting your goals or experiencing magic in your day-to-day? Are you superstitious? I am superstitious when it comes to routine, or maybe that's a bit of an OCD tendency. From my heart to yours, Black Cat. Great questions. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. I'll do my best to answer these. Um, What do I think is the most essential aspect of my routine that lends to my success? Okay. Well, I just want to be clear that my idea of success is legitimately having uh, healthy relationships and being healthy uh, mentally, physically, And I I don't always feel like I am successful, (laughs) to be honest, but that's what I strive for. What do I think are the most essential aspects of that, of my routine? Part of my routine involves uh, exercise, getting a really good night's sleep every night. I have a vegan lifestyle, so I believe that helps keep me healthy overall. And and I think me being physically, mentally, you know, healthy, exercising every day, at least 30 minutes... Uh, getting my heart rate up, and meditation. All of these things aid in me having healthy relationships. I hope that answered that question. Do you have any advice on manifesting your goals or experiencing magic in your day-to-day? I think my best advice on manifesting magic is to do your best to just show up every day at work, do the best that you can do, and that's when magic will happen or is likely to happen. But I do believe in luck. I think if you show up for work, you are going to be a luckier person. (laughs) If you only think positive thoughts, I don't think that's enough. I think action has so much power. So really trying to make the steps to do the, do a little bit of the thing you love to do every day and really think about where you want to get to and then uh, break it down into stages and steps and what you think, um, you might need to do to achieve your goals. For me, it's getting up early, 7 a.m., meditation, eating healthy breakfast, and then actually going to my office and reading, writing, starting work. And that's what I mean by showing up. I just am a happier person when I have routine and when I'm working on something, or working towards something. I think it's a combination of trying to think positively and realistically and then showing up at your desk. Am I superstitious? I don't know. I mean, I know that I feel better when I follow a routine and I feel badly and maybe guilty when I get off of routine. So I always try to go back to some kind of routine. My routine can change depending on the seasons. You know, or if I'm on tour, if I'm home a lot more. Um, So I kind of adjust things all the time. But uh, I mean, maybe I am superstitious. I mean, yeah, I believe that if I don't have a routine, I'm going to be fucked. So maybe, yeah. But yeah, maybe I am superstitious. Uh, Thanks so much, Black Cat. And I can't wait to hear uh, the Heartbeat Hotline voice messages Please call the hotline 
and ask me whatever question you want and leave a comment about any of the episodes. You know, this podcast didn't just happen overnight. It took years to develop, think about, and, you know, mentor with other people. So I'm happy it's finally here. A Chat with Heart, produced and written by me, Christina Martin, co-produced and engineered by Dale Murray. Check out Dale's website, dalemurray.ca. The podcast theme song, Talk About It, was written by me and recorded by Dale Murray. You can find it on all the places you stream music. Production plans for this podcast and season one are supported by the province of Nova Scotia's Women in Business Implementation Fund and the Creative Industries Fund. Special thanks to Terrence Taylor for mentoring me on hosting this podcast and really digging deep with me on my production plans for season one, which, let's be honest, Terrence, ended up being more like well-needed psychotherapy for me. To Crystal Seeberger at Sensory Friendly Solutions, thank you from the bottom of my heart for helping me learn how to be a more inclusive, accessible, and sensory-friendly human. Visit my Patreon page to become a monthly or yearly supporter of this podcast and my music endeavors. If you're new to Patreon, it's a membership platform that helps creators get paid. Sign up at patreon.com forward slash Christina Martin. For this to be a massive success and reach 7 billion people, I need you to share, rate, leave a review, and subscribe to A Chat With Heart on all the places you listen to podcasts. Wishing you, my little heartbeats, a great day.